everybody. Welcome to Mind Body Healing Through the Arts. This is our final presentation for this particular semester, and we're delighted that you're here. Uh, today we're focusing on drama therapy, and we have two very special guests I'd like to introduce to you all. Uh, first is uh, Diana Kaufman, who, uh, Dr. Diana Kaufman, she is a, a psychiatrist for, specializing in working with children at UMDNJ, uh, University Hospital in Newark, uh, New Jersey. And she is also the founder and director of uh, Creative Arts and Health Care uh, at UMDNJ, where she puts on a lot of different uh, arts and, and uh, expressive therapy uh, workshops for healthcare professionals and, and parents and all different kinds of of people. She um, is also an expressive therapy and education facilitator specializing in poetry therapy. And she's a wonderful poet as well, and the author of this wonderful children's book, The Bird Who Wants to Fly. And her partner today is Jody Rabinowitz. She is a drama therapist, graduated from NYU, and she lives in New Haven and has worked. Uh, in trauma therapy with children and adults for several years, and um, that's her specialty, is, is trauma. So let's welcome Diana and Jody. And take it away. Well, welcome. So glad to be here, and I'm so glad that you're here, too. Um, the topic for tonight is trauma, creativity, and healing. Uh, and what I think Jody and I most want to happen tonight is for all of us to have a meaningful experience and an enjoyable experience. And along the way, um, have some insight into how our ever-present unconscious um, is uh, helping us uh, to uh, recover, to grow, expand, and to have resilience to face a new day, right? Um, we'd like to begin with a warm-up exercise, right? Um, and then we're going to be going into the presentation, and then we're going to be having an experiential, and we're going to um, be keeping a bit of an eye on the clock to see if we can keep the pace going so that we're able to accomplish that, okay? Uh, but first, I think we'd like to, uh, to know a little bit about you, right? Um, so um, perhaps you could, we could have a raising of hands. Um, are there faculty here? Okay, and in what? Okay, great. <laughs> um, I teach in writing and humanities, and I have actually been teaching here for 17 years. Oh, wow. Uh, my name is Sharon Mesmer, and I'm actually teaching um, a workshop at the Poetry Project right now. Oh, wonderful. Which is called Cathexis Catharsis, Writing to and Through Suffering. So that's why this was very interesting to yes. me. Great. And you would mention, you would raise your hand too? Yeah. Thomas Boskett, painting and drawing, color-related issues, perception, consciousness, um, raising, sort of, that's the, the pool okay. around um, thinking the range of students that I teach mm -hmm. at the university, really. So I was thinking what group, but it's everybody comes through okay. us. Okay, well, welcome. Good, yeah. Are there um, artists here? Yeah, and, and this, again, is for all of us to get to know each other a little bit. Uh, my name is Matthew. Um, I was a singer, dancer, actor for a number of years. Um, have since chosen a different career path. But um, I'm also a, a Reiki master of uh, oh, wow. 17 years. So mm -hmm. I find the whole um, working with healing and, and creativity and trauma obviously very intriguing and combining all of it. Great. So. And I think behind, you, right? Did you raise your hand too? Thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Everett. I'm actually a textile artist, and I've been going to these lectures um, because I'm considering um, a career change mm -hmm. into creative arts therapy. Oh, wonderful. Good. Are there um, clinicians here, uh, therapists? Okay, great. Okay. 
something? Yes. Well, I'm a music therapist. Right. And, uh, any kind of trauma-related workshops are fantastic for my work. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, and also, are there students here? I mean, we're all lifelong students, but yes? Uh, hi, I'm Oliver, and I'm here as a, as a student for the Creative Arts Therapy Program at um, the New School. Okay. Have I left anyone out? Artist. <laughs> My name is Jennifer, and I'm a Parsons alum and a painter. Oh, great. Oh, wonderful. Good. Anyone we missed? Riva, and I'm an artist, uh, a teacher, an art teacher, and I'm always looking for new ideas. Great. Okay, good. And did you share also? No? <laughs> My name is Estefania. I'm a medical doctor, also a former dancer, and I'm interested in creative oh. arts therapy. Good. Good, so we're, we have everyone and everything represented in the room. Right, great. So I'd like you to take a look at the poem that was on your seat, okay? And I felt that this poem by Maya Angelou very much spoke to the theme of tonight, right? And what I'd like us to do um, is to go around the room, right? And we'll have to kind of keep track of going around the room in a circle. But if you could read, let's say, uh, two, uh, two lines of the poem, right, at a time. So you could start here. Right? OK. A caged bird, a free bird leaps on the back of the wind. And flows down a stream with a current in it. And dips its wings in orange sun rays. And dares to claim the sky. A bird that stalks. Down his narrow cage can seldom Caged bird sings with a fearful trill. Of things unknown but longed for still. And his tune is heard on the distant hill. For the caged bird sings of freedom. The free bird thinks of another breeze, and the trade winds soft through the sighing trees. And the fat worm is waiting on the blonde bright arm, and he names the sky his own. But a caged bird stands on the grave of dreams. His shadow shouts on a nightmare scream. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful thrill. Of things unknown, but long for still. And his tune is heard on the distant hill. For the caged bird sings of freedom. I would also like us, perhaps all of us as a group, to read the last stanza aloud together. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but long for still. And his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. Johnny? So now what I'm going to ask everyone to do is to close your eyes and Take a moment to reflect on your body. Take a nice deep breath from your belly. And I want you to do a very quick scan of your body, focusing on where you feel resilient, where you feel strong, where you feel strength. And if for some reason you don't feel that way, I want you to notice a part in your body where you might feel strong or you might have felt strong in the past. And take a moment to notice what it feels like to concentrate on that part of your body and breathe into it. And notice what your body is doing when you're putting all that attention there. And when you're ready, I want you to open your eyes and we're all gonna gather in a circle together. So we're going to start with a little drama therapy exercise um, just to get warmed up and get to know each other a little bit. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to go round in a circle. I'm going to start. And I'm going to offer up a movement and a sound that's based on how I feel about the poem and about the part of my body where I feel resilient. 
and I'm going to share it with all of you, and then I'm going to ask you to mirror it back to me. Okay? with our presentation mm -hmm. now. So again, the the title of our presentation is Trauma, Creativity, and Healing. And I also want to add that word resilience. Right? I think it's so interesting that um, Jody and I have given this uh, presentation, but it's continuing to grow and develop. Um, and uh, we had given it at the um, uh, New York State Psychological Association Conference. It was on like arts and healing and psychology. The International Health Humanities Conference um, at Montclair University. And it's interesting because, and now we're here. And it's interesting that each time we're thinking about this topic, we learn more, right? And in doing it this time, the idea of resilience really came through loud and clear, right? Because there's trauma, there's hurt, there's healing. But most importantly, where where is the resilience, right? And how do we find that? How do we sustain that? How do we discover that? I also want to give credit to someone who's not in the room, but she is everywhere in the artwork, and that is Olya Koletsai, uh, who is the artist that you'll see uh, all the pictures of the story. She's a, um, a Salva Regina University, uh, um, I think, bachelor level student in art. So we're going to be, in a sense, telling a, a story upon a story, right? And going on a journey um, together. Um, and I'll be, I'll be going into this in more detail a little bit later. But basically, um, 
In 2010, I participated in a Therapeutic Arts Alliance of Manhattan workshop um, uh, at, at Judson Memorial Church. Uh, Emily Nash um, and Stephanie Wise are the directors. And the theme was um, on uh, integration and identity, and the workshop was for um, clinicians, right, to nurture the clinician. Right, and find the inner artist and have healing take place. Um, and in that, through the process of that workshop, uh, a story was written. And, there, and there's a, again, there's the theme of a story within a story. It's a personal story, it's a children's story, and it's a much larger story too. And from the experience, there were images that were drawn, which I will be sharing with you later. And out of those images, through time, um, and when I say time, uh, on a very rational level, I'm talking like maybe a year later or so, I started wondering, where did those images come from, right? Uh, and that embarked me on a journey with Jody on um, archetypes, right? And learning more about the, the imagery and why the story spoke, I think, so deeply to so many people. And again, uh, our thought is, and it's not just our thought, if Carl Jung was in the room, right, he would be standing up and taking a bow. Uh, and I also want to share um, sort of the uh, hidden story of psychiatry, because Carl Jung was a psychiatrist, and many psychiatrists don't know that. Uh, that uh, the primal source, right, of images story is within the collective unconscious, uh, and the, in a sense, the story that we all know, right, um, and, the, and the archetypes. And with archetypes, there's a kind of a crossing over between the conscious and the unconscious. And you need both aspects of the mind to have a uh, fulfilling um, development of the archetypes in, in our lives. And, it's, and he particularly said, and I think that what happened in my own experience is an example of this, that the, that the images have a specific meaning to the person. So there's a larger meaning. Right? There may be a meaning in one's past. There may be a meaning in the present. Uh, there may be the collective unconscious meaning. But there's also a particular meaning to that person, to, in a sense, to have them really come alive. And as this beautiful flower shows, right, that as a plant produces its flower, so the psyche creates its symbols. And I was reading a poem recently it might be by Browning, I'm not quite sure, but it, it's, you ever hear the, the uh, phrase, the release of the uh, inner splendor, right? Um, uh, well, at another time I'll share with Louise the poem, but the idea is that there, there's something inside that needs to be released. You know, so often we talk about the outside coming in, but the inner splendor is that sense of the flower, you know, blooming and blossoming. So even in the sense, I was thinking recently, the idea of, you know, when you hold your breath, I know I do that a lot, like when I'm tense, I'm, I'm, you get tight. That it's not only the tightness may be protecting yourself from the outside, and that may or may not be a good idea, but when we cut ourselves off and tighten ourselves, it's almost like you're cutting yourself off from the flowing of that inner thing inside you that's healing. And in terms of working with so, uh, someone who's um, experienced trauma, and uh, you know, trauma, um, sadly, it, it may not be um, that, it, that it's um, rare. It can be commonplace, uh, it's kind of frighteningly so. It's becoming more trauma, traumatic. But it's also the idea that, that a person's inner resources are not able to keep pace with what's happening. So it's really, you have to look at both aspects. If someone may say, well, that's not so terrible. There's a thousand things worse. But for that particular person, it may be overwhelming. And to help someone to, quote, work through or work with or to, in a sense, make something of that terrible experience in a productive way, um, in a sense, you have to be able to speak about it. However, words may not, right? Words, 
the, the words can be impotent. They, they don't at all convey what the person wants to express. Or it may be frightening to use you know, language itself. Or a person may say there are no words, right? The ultimate uh, response is silence, right? So, but in a sense, it's still the therapeutic work is to find a way to speak about the unspeakable so that we can hear it ourselves, someone else can hear it, right? And change can take place. And within symbolism, right? So um, it, you, you could talk about a sad little bird, right? And in a sense, project that imagery. You could talk about the sad little bird. But to talk about yourself, right, and the hurt you, you feel may be more difficult. But using the symbol can be an easier way to communicate. So unfortunately, if we're going to work with people, we're going to work with trauma. Because like what Diana was saying, um, trauma is not rare. Um, anyone who's worked with people sees that trauma and traumatic events comes up a lot uh, when working with people. So trauma is, um, can come about when somebody witnesses or experiences something that um, can uh, make them feel like they're going to lose their life or um, that they're in danger or somebody that they love or care about is in danger. Uh, and this can be anything from uh, sexual or physical abuse to um, rape, carjacking, jackings, war, um, anything really. Um, I'd like to add yeah. vicarious trauma. <laughs> right. Vicarious, you want to say something? Different? Sure. Um, vicarious trauma is something that I've done a lot of work with. Um, people that work with trauma a lot tend to get the same symptoms of PTSD that their clients do, even without going through. Um, the same traumatic event. And if you don't attend to it, and if you don't talk to people about it, it can really overwhelm you. So it's important to, to point that out, that vicarious or secondary trauma is something that happens. Um, Judith Herman writes that traumatic events are extraordinary, and it's not because they're rare, like Diana was saying, but it's because they overwhelm the ordinary human adaptations to life. Um, and she says something really interesting, which connected to what Diana was saying, which is that trauma is unspeakable because she says here, the most traumatic events of her life take place outside the realm of socially validated reality. Her experience becomes unspeakable. And this can be from somebody who um, has the ability to verbalize but is unable to put words to the experience because words just cannot capture it. Or it can be um, a child, I work with children now, who are um, not able to speak yet and as they grow older and they start remembering images, the images are fragmented and they are not connected to words. And that can be very, very scary. Um, I was just thinking of a story of um, a little boy who was bit by a dog when he was, I think, under the age of one. And nobody, his parents didn't tell him that he was bit by a dog, but he grew up being afraid of dogs and had no connection between that fear and the experience. So it was very scary for him. Um, that's a commonplace uh, example, but it can be uh, anything from sexual abuse to physical abuse before the age of one. As they grow older, um, certain things can make people very, very scared and not have the experience to connect to that emotion. So when people experience traumatic events, sometimes uh, nothing happens, but sometimes they develop things like post-traumatic stress disorder or right after the event, acute stress disorder. And um, symptoms come up, such as re-experiencing, um, having nightmares, having flashbacks of the event that happened to them, um, being aroused, um, being quick to anger, not being able to sleep, um, avoiding it, not wanting to talk about things that remind them of the trauma, not wanting to be um, around people, places, or things that remind them of the trauma. And it can really affect um, people's relationships. Trauma, above all, is a rupture in relationships. Uh, when you're a little kid, it's, uh, why didn't you protect me? Even when you're older, how come this happened to me? You know, this is not, I'm a good person. This stuff is not supposed to happen to me. And it interferes with living a normal life. Um, and the other thing is that a lot of times I find that clinicians are scared to bring up trauma because they are worried about re-traumatizing their clients or they hope that, oh, if I don't mention it, you know, maybe, you know, 
maybe things will get better. But the thing is, is that it's always on people's minds. You know, when, when bad things happen, people are constantly anxious and they're constantly reminded. And um, it's important to ask. Not all clinicians ask. Um, but I, I find that it's very important to ask what happened if something did happen. Um, so like Diana was saying before, it's very important that in treatment, um, we use different techniques to explore what happened and to process it um, so that the person is able to integrate what happened into their lives and make meaning. Um, you can't undo the bad thing that happened, but you can learn to, um, you can learn to live with it, you can learn to move on, and you can learn to connect the emotions with the experience. Actually, I think I want to go back to that picture again. If you notice, um, this terrified person, right, is almost, who knows, they might be stuck in the middle of the bridge, right? Um, scared to go back, scared to go forward, you know, immobilized in the moment. Also, the people behind, right, they don't know, and on some level, why should they know? But it could, but, but it could also heighten a person's isolation, right, that they're all alone, you know, with that experience. So then one thinks, well, how does one uh, recover from this, right? Um, how does one transform the trauma? How does one know that however awful that experience was, that it has, a, in a sense, it had a beginning, it had a middle, it had an end in time, right? But the person, in a sense, if they're traumatized, is trapped in the trauma, they're in, imprisoned in it. It's going wherever they go, and they may also have, in some sense, a repetition compulsion, right, to make it end better, but if you don't have the skills, it's gonna end the same. So, in a sense, it's a downward spiral. Um, however, that's the goal, to transform it. And it has to do with healing connections. Right? Um, the connection with oneself, right? which would be to be able to hear one's own story through therapy, also to have it be a mo more coherent story, to be able to position that story as a memory rather than as a, as a recurrence in the presence, um, connection with uh, healthy family members, the community, um, a larger community, spirituality, uh, advocacy, and also within the therapeutic relationship. So, so it is all about connections. And what I think Jody said so beautifully, it's all about relationships, healing relationships. So in that process, again, you know, we have a, a variety of um, modalities that we can use. Um, the creative arts, which we'll, uh, specifically we'll be talking about tonight. And in this picture, I think you can see the realm of relationships between parents and children or loving, caring adults and young children. Um, animals, sometimes, you know, when people have been too scary, right? Um, animals or plants, nature, you know, Art itself can be a healing comfort as well. Okay. I was do doing some reading of Philip Levine, and some of you may know of him. And what I really found so fascinating um, was his uh, talking about the, um, the strength of the body right, which can so much be cut off in a trauma experience. The body's natural mechanism could be to, what, to fight, flight, or freeze. They all may be appropriate, and freezing can be very appropriate. Um, however, if one has become numb or frozen, he, he postulates that there's an energy in the body that's still contained in the body, and that it's not being released, and that it, there needs to be, you could almost call it a muscular catharsis. There needs to be a physical expression in actuality 
meaning kicking, screaming, pushing, doing something that would have been the natural response if the person who had been traumatized was in a safe position or a protected position in order to mobilize their own body, right? And, and through his understanding, he's um, this quote that the trauma sufferer is, can identify themselves as survivors, and, and, and they are, and that's wonderful. But, but that's not necessarily tapping into the body strength, the idea of embodiment, and that there is an instinctual power to heal and to rebound from the threat. He says, we must pay attention to our animal nature. And I, I really love that, because it's really saying, don't, don't be afraid of that. That's your healer. That's you. We're human animals. We, we tend to forget that, right? Um, and that uh, we need to develop strategies to release that energy. Yeah, quick question? Yeah, sure. Is this from his book or his work about it's like the tiger? That yes. Like yes, it is. And there's, we, at the end, we have a bibliography that you can look at. Oh, and if you want to give us your email addresses, we can send you the, the slideshow. When Diana was talking, I was thinking about um, a lot of times with, with little kids, when they start thinking about the, um, the stuff that they went through, they need to move. And the reason is, is that talking about it and thinking about it raises their stress hormones. Because at the time, you know, our, our bodies are great and our bodies give us stress hormones so that we can fight, flight, or freeze. So sometimes when you're working with adults too, but I'm thinking about kids, what they need more than anything is to move, to run, to kick, to scream, to, to get it out. So I think the picture of the tiger is a great example. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, using story in therapy and about some of the benefits um, of using story in therapy. Um, it helps activate the imagination and promotes creativity. Um, it also um, gives appropriate distance to talk about difficult topics. Uh, like Diana was saying before, sometimes it's easier to talk about what happened to the poor little bird instead of talking about what happened to me. Um, it teaches empathy. It helps integrate traumatic events. Um, stories can represent internal and external conflicts and give people um, examples of what they might do in a particular situation. Um, also teaches right from wrong. And um, stories can be used to help work through conflicts, uh, to see an example of what somebody else would have done. Um, there are many ways that stories can be used in therapy. Some examples are um, creating stories individually or as groups or with a therapist, um, changing sp parts of known stories, changing the end. Uh, a lot of times working with uh, children will talk about a fairy tale and then end it right before the end and ask the child, well, how do you think it ends? or um, what's a way that it could end? You know, what would be the best way it can end? What about the worst way it could end? Um, also, reading stories and exploring uh, your own connection to your life. And um, stories can be used as assessments to see where clients are coming from. And also, it can be used as treatments. So myths are, um, when you talk about myths, we talk about um, how they carry the attitudes of society that created them. Um, and not only does it do that, but it carries the attitudes of the people that tell the myths and the people that keep telling it. When you think about fairy tales that your parents might have told you, somebody told it to them. And there's a reason they're telling it to you. And you notice that things change depending on who tells it. So it gives a, a clue to what's going on in that person's life. You know, Why are they telling you the story at this time? And st all stories actually have meaning, meaning intergenerationally. Stories are created to help people grapple with the existential questions. Um, why are we here? What is our purpose? Um, why do bad things happen to good people? You know, stories are put out there to help us make meaning of life and of uh, problems in life. Like we were talking before, symbols and archetypes are concise but significant images that send a message about the human condition. Um, Jung said that images, oh, sorry, Jung said that archetypes are images and emotions that happen concurrently. And uh, like Diana was saying before, archetypes have both personal meaning and collective meaning. Uh, when you think about the collective unconscious, you know. Um, 
archetypes and symbols have meaning across generations and across people through different cultures, but can mean something personal to you. So while working with a client, you might want to find out what the symbol means to them and see you know, if that has anything to do with what it means to other people. Um, we used the example of Narcissus because we thought it was a great example. Um, the story of Narcissus is about obsessive self-love. And if you think about it, it's been repeated throughout the ages, as are most myths and most stories. Um, Young believe that the mind uses representations such as archetypes to make meaning. One of the tools that Jung used um, was active imagination. He thought of it as the connection between the unconscious and the conscious. Um, what he would do is he would use the unconscious in the form of dreams or images that pop into his clients' minds. And um, he would explore the images and explore the stories and have a dialogue with the stories. Uh, one of my favorite ideas from Jung is that um, when one does not attend to the symbols and archetypes that pop up in your dreams, your meditations, or your thoughts, um, you have no connection to sometimes the dark and uncomfortable parts of your unconscious. And you know, some people don't want to think about the dark and uncomfortable parts of their unconscious because they're scary. The problem is when you don't make that connection, you're still going to have those thoughts, but you're going to have no idea where they came from. And, and that's the trouble. And those thoughts come out in bad dreams and you know, certain bad behaviors and disturbing thoughts. So in therapy, we use stories and play to make that connection. And I would add to what Jody said that if we don't um, reflect on our, our inner shadow, right, then that's projected out to others. And you see that, that, that darkness only out there coming towards you rather than attached to one on the side. Right, and that, that shows up in relationships a lot, too, projecting it onto people who, um, who you care about. So back to the beginning, uh, when we first began, July 31st, 2010, I was participating at the Therapeutic Arts Alliance. Uh, and um, it was a series on honoring the artist within. So the, the workshop was an all-day workshop. And there was a, uh, a process that Stephanie and Emily um, had developed, um, which you can see from the, um, the bottom up of the purple, there was, um, just as Jody was earlier, we did, there was movement without sound. There was mirroring each other. There could be like passing the movement to the next person. Right, and then you change it somewhat and you pass it to the next one. Uh, there was um, throwing a ball back and forth you know, on two rows and you'd be making sounds as you'd be doing it. The other person would be mirroring. Uh, and all this was leading into the idea of, I guess on some extent, loosening us, us up, uh, tapping into that inner creativity, forming a community, and most importantly, none of this can happen unless you feel safe. Okay? So um, I think that external safety and acceptance, and if someone didn't want to participate, you know, nobody was forced to participate, um, you, you honored each person's response. Right? And then uh, there was, um, as I said, nonverbal uh, relaxation, a painting. One embodied the image. There was writing, a psychodrama, and then a, a discussion, a reflection together. Now, I want to share with you my own experience. So, you know, I was at the workshop, and I was there, um, I was there for myself, <laughs> and I feel good saying that, right? I was there because I uh, needed to be in a supportive, nurturing uh, community, and I wanted to uh, um, know more about myself, and I wanted to help myself heal in whatever way that I could. 
So I was participating in all these um, movements and vocalizations, and then the uh, workshop facilitators asked us, they, there, were th there were three parts of ourselves that they wanted us to become in touch with. Uh, in a sense, there was a, um, a predominant self, perhaps a shadow self, and was there a synthesis self? So they um, said we should take some drawing materials, and it, it was a, kind of a piece of paper this big, and use your non-dominant hand, and just kind of put your hand with an implement, a drawing implement, and make some lines, and not focusing on drawing something. It was more whatever that energy was, somehow let it out on the paper. Then we were asked to um, look at what we drew and see if there was an image. And out of that, to kind of pull the image out, add to the picture, and then give it a title, a name. And so my first picture, um, which I added to make into a bird, because it was not originally a bird, or perhaps it was, right? But I made it into a bird by adding an eye and did some things around the wing. And I named it Bird That Wants to Fly. My next picture, um, again, it was not originally a horse. It was some shapes that looked to me like a horse. And I called it beautiful animal that you are, which I later changed to beautiful animal that I am. And then the third picture was two loop-de-loops that I decided would be a roller coaster. And I added a please enter sign with three uh, little arrows going in. And um, I guess I came into the group with some issues, because <laughs> I wrote, Roller coasting can be fun, true or false or both. Then, okay, maybe put that away a moment. Then what we were um, asked to do was to embody the image. All of us were doing this because everyone had drawn images. So we had a circle, and then um, I would, I, since it was my turn, I went to the center of the circle and I dramatized the bird. I was the bird. And so I was, you know, flapping my wings or limping and talking about what it was like to be a bird that couldn't fly. Then I became beautiful animal that I am and was uh, very beautiful and confident and talked about what that was like. Then I, then I became the roller coaster uh, and I talked about how exhilarating it was to be on the roller coaster, how scary it was. You could fall off the roller coaster, you could die, you could throw up, um, you were out of control because somebody else is running the roller coaster. So I became all those, those images. Then what happened was um, we were, not yet, <laughs> okay. okay, then, um, shall, I, shall I go into the story now? Yes? Sure. Yeah, okay. The story story? Yeah. Okay. And then we can go, let's go back, okay? okay. To the, we can do the story now, and then we'll go back. Yep, you're good. I'm, I'm putting yeah. it up. Okay. So since this wasn't our original order, but it just seems to be flowing in this direction. So, uh, so what happened was um, then after uh, we embodied the images, we were asked to write something. What I'm going to be showing you is the actual story word for word that I wrote in the workshop. Um, about a month later, I happened to be looking at a college catalog from Salva Regina University where I had done some expressive arts training, and I saw Olia, whom I had never met, her artwork in the catalog, and I thought her, and she had done some illustrations for a children's book about zoo animals. I thought they were just so amazing that I contacted the college and I asked them to track her down for me. And then over a year on the internet, and she, we never met each other face to face. Um, she lives in California now. We developed the story, and this is the story. So Bird That Wants to Fly by myself and Olya. The bird that wants to fly was limping along by the winter carnival. 
She passed the please enter sign of the roller coaster attraction, tail feathers neatly tucked between her legs. Oh my, she sighed, life is so long and dreary. Looking down, she came across a puddle. It must have rained, but she hadn't noticed. So preoccupied she was with yesterday's miscalculations. As she put one foot in, she noticed a reflection, a magical horse with blue mascara, the words, beautiful animal that I am. Although it hurt her neck to do so, she looked up. The blue-eyed horse with the pink mane was only a few inches away. The bird made the tiniest chirp, and beautiful animal that I am hurt her. She said, little bird, why are you walking, not flying? Doesn't it take longer that way? The bird paused in her steps and grew thoughtful. She was so used to only her own company that all this came as a surprise. She cleared her throat with three chirps and replied, I used to know how to fly. You did, asked beautiful animal. What happened? It's a long, sad story. Can you stay a while? Oh, yes, said beautiful horse. I'm not in a hurry. I can stay here as long as you like. Oh, and would you like to rest on my back? You might be more comfortable if your story is as long as you say. Horse, what a lovely suggestion. Why, thank you. And with that, bird that wants to fly pulled herself up on the stirrups, hoisted herself upon the saddle, and rested her head on the pink mane of beautiful horse. She had worked so hard, her heart was pounding. Better rest a while, said beautiful animal, and so the bird did. When she opened her eyes, it was evening. She thought, I must have been so tired and didn't know it. I'm sure it must have been morning when I started to walk. Beautiful animal was awake and said, tell me your story. I am so eager to know you. Once again, bird chirped and plucked up her courage. It's a story that is so long, I better shorten it lest I forget where I was going. Here's the whole thing in one sentence. I was born to fly and I did fly, and I have beautiful wings, but I was caught in snowstorms and rainstorms, not to mention blizzards and freezing rain and children with rocks, and men with shotguns, and other birds bumping and crashing. And it goes on and on, so I decided to walk. Beautiful animal thought it over, and this is what she said. Want to go on the roller coaster with me? I know the owner, and we can have a ride, just us two. The lights of the roller coaster were dazzling, and the please enter sign so inviting. Only one request, please, said beautiful animal. I want to see your beautiful wings. Won't you fly to the coaster seat? It's just over there, not so far away. It's a good way to begin. So there, the wings. Little bird who wants to fly took a deep breath and with a loud and most beautiful chirp, spread her wings. There she is, flying. Dedicated to the love in our hearts that heals all broken wings. So, Joan, if you could go back to the picture. I'm gonna go back to this one. Yeah. So, in thinking about where did that story come from and where did those images come from, um, it led me on a journey, right? And as I said, there's a, the moment of the workshop and what was inspired in the workshop, then one's own past that one may or may not be in that moment conscious of, but it is your past, and then the collective unconscious and the archetypes. So there was the workshop. And then uh, I discovered, and I always knew this, 
Um, but I discovered when my um, uh, parents had died, and especially my mother had died, and my mother had saved everything, I found a composition that I wrote. Now, I don't know, I, for a long time, and Jody can vouch for this, I thought I wrote this for school. But, uh, and it's a young handwriting, so it must have been um, seven, eight, right? Eight years old. But when I look at it now, and it took me, what, years and years of looking at this, it was like, wait a minute, my name is on both sides. That's, that's not for school. I don't think it's for school. Maybe my mother, who was a child guidance counselor, asked me to write this, or maybe I just wrote it because I needed to write it. But what I, what I wrote, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's describing an experience I had, which is a true experience, and I have verification, where I had been molested by some children in the neighborhood when I was about, I would say, six years old. And what I'm saying is the title of my composition is My First Enemy. And it says, uh, one day I was playing with my friend Nancy. She was playing with Susan, a girl who lived next door. Uh, we were playing in a pit. Suddenly uh, we heard someone saying, Nancy, Nancy. Nancy went to her house. Then the action began. It was not fun, if you think so. I tried to run away. It was no use. Suddenly I had an idea. I said I heard my uh, mother calling, but that didn't work either. And, and then it goes on in terms of what happened. Um, so in a sense, um, I think this story about a traumatic experience with myself and uh, integration and identity, having this bird be a traumatized uh, little you know, birdling, there was a link between those. Want to go on? Yeah. And also, I actually just noticed this now. In the story, little kids are throwing rocks at the bird. Yeah. That was just, that was oh, just very right. interesting. Yeah. Yeah, because it was a sand pit behind some houses. Right. Do you want to go? Sure. So um, Diane and I started talking about the symbols of the bird and the horse. And we got really curious about what are these archetypes and what do they mean? So we did some research to find out what are some common meanings behind the symbols of birds and horses. And we found that birds are uh, connections between heaven and earth, like shamans. Um, they can fly in the air and they can come down to the ground. Uh, they're spiritual messengers. And a lot of different cultures believe that they carry souls, um, either souls to earth or souls to heaven. Um, and a lot of birds and stories have um, a healing capacity to them. Horses in stories tend to be either untamed or very noble. Um, they are very loyal to their masters. Um, they can be lustful and very sexual. There's um, a lot of very sexual energy around horses in stories. Um, they are magical. They predict the future. Uh, they know the truth. They know who the good guys are and the bad guys. And horses are also represented as being um, healing and being the protectors. And the um, oh, back one time. And of course, the combination of bird and horse is the flying horse, the horse with wings, the pegasus. And um, they are like a combination of the attributes of the bird and the horse. Um, they are messengers, and they combine the nobility of the horse and the power with the bird's freedom and the ability to transcend to the heavens. And uh, again, with the writing of this story, I want to say that I felt that the story came through me. It, it wasn't something that I was planfully writing is just, I'm sure that some of us or all of us, you've had that experience that suddenly there's an idea, some, suddenly there's a song or a picture or a story. So I felt that something was coming through me. And then another association, it was like, wow, I write poetry. You know, I, I, uh, I even have like a little purple and silver stuffed animal pegasus or one of those little eggs, right, with a spinning pegasus. So so I'm constantly, on some level, thinking about Pegasus. And of all stories in the world, I'm doing a, a bird and a horse. Um, and I'll say that when I was reading Levine's um, book, I was totally blown away when I read this. Because this was, this was, of course, 
after I had written this story and was trying to explore what this all meant, um, he said, uh, and you may remember, right, Medusa? Medusa became hideous because she offended Athena. So she uh, had snakes. Uh, anybody looked at Medusa would turn to stone. Uh, and the way that she was slain by, I think it was uh, Perseus, was he had right, a shield and he looked in the shield and then was able to kill her. Well, wouldn't you know it, it was out of the blood of Medusa that Pegasus was born. So he says, interestingly enough, when Medusa was slain, two things emerged from her body. Pegasus, the winged horse, and this other character that nobody seems to remember, who's Chrysor, the twin, a warrior with a golden sword. And Peter Levine says, we could not find a more appropriate metaphor around healing from trauma. The sword symbolizes absolute truth, the mythic hero's ultimate weapon of defense. The truth, what happened? What happened and also who, who I am, beautiful animal that I am. Since the horse represents instinct and body, the winged horse speaks of transformation through embodiment. Together, the winged horse and the golden sword, truth, are auspicious symbols for the resources traumatized people discover in the process of vanquishing their own medusas. So I, well, 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 hopefully we'll have some time for discussion later, but on a personal level, it was just uh, sort of an epiphany or sort of a shocking moment to see that these characters also had another meaning and another meaning on a mythic level and also from this trauma expert in how we can approach healing from trauma in a symbolic, archetypical way. And when you remember the story of Pegasus, it was his hoof that started the spring for the muses. And Pegasus is a symbol, I think, of poetry and yep. artists, yes, too, right? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. so, so interesting, it all just comes together. OK. So I just wanted to list a few clinical applications of um, the work that we did. Um, some things that you can do with people. Um, I love asking clients to choose a favorite story um, and have a dialogue with the images or talk about um, what different characters might say or what different characters might do differently. Uh, it's a great assessment and treatment. Um, also having clients write a poem or story or song that relates to their life and then to explore uh, connections with archetypal themes. Um, like I said before, having clients write uh, what happens next in a story, poem, or song lyric, and you can combine this with movement, poetry, drama, really anything. Um, one thing that we really love to do, we did at another workshop, was we shared the phoenix bird myth, um, talking about resilience. And we asked clients, we asked the participants to reflect on the phoenix bird and on their own phoenix bird and their own experiences of resilience and strength. I have a clinical example of this too. And also as an aside to say, when we were exploring about the, the phoenix myth, the phoenix was the mythical bird. Uh, one existed at a time, and it lived 500 to 1,000 years. And, it, and this myth is in almost all cultures. Um, and there's an association with the, the sun god, with Egyptology. There's an association with the resurrection and Jesus Christ. Um, the, it, Hans Christian Andersen even wrote a story called The Phoenix Bird. And at the very end of the story, he poses the question, what is the phoenix bird? And he answers poetry, which in my, at least my personal interpretation, I, I think he means creativity is the resurrector, to create again, right? To renew oneself. And the, a clinic, a very brief clinical vignette, I, I knew a um, parent and a child who experienced a terrible, terrible, tragic loss related to a fire. And in meeting with them for a quote, I quote routine, that's so horrible, intake, right? It wasn't, no one is routine, right? And this clearly was, um, uh, this family was still grieving, although the event had happened years be before. And when I asked the question, 
how can I help you, sort of why are you here, the whole story came out about the trauma. And uh, I wanted, uh, my role was not to fix them, because you can't fix anybody, nor should you, but I wanted to be there with them, and so I put down everything that I was doing, and in a respectful way, in a sincere way, I listened to their story, and I also shared with them the story of the phoenix, identifying with them that what happened to them was real and not a story and tra tragic, but that, that this story of the phoenix, it reminded me a little bit of it because in the loss of meaning, people go towards myth to find meaning. I asked the, uh, the uh, youngster, did she like to write? And she just happened to like to write. And she started to write a poem entitled The Phoenix. I was the scribe, I was typing the poem here, my window is here. The, the parent was here, the youngster was here. As we're doing the poem, both of them say, do you see the light coming through the window? And I said, what light? because I was looking this way. And in a sense, miraculously, but in truth it was happening, there were beams of sunlight um, hitting them. And we added that to the poem, right? See, and, and the poem became about God, and there's a phoenix rising with me, and that God is gonna tell you when the time is right. They took the poem home with them, and they shared it with their family members. So there is a way to incorporate um, in a sensitive manner poetry writing, myth, you know, in a healing way, to the benefit of the client. It's not the benefit for us to say, oh, it reminds me of a myth, right? Okay. Okay. So now we would like to um, have time for the experiential. And what Jody is going to be um, handing out are a um, a packet of, um, of poems and also a beautiful, and I'll, I'll hold this up, a really beautiful illustration of part of Maya Angelou's poem, Still I Rise, which is a phoenix bird poem, right? The, and in a sense, it's the, the phoenix bird in us, right? Um, this is from a... Um, uh, a magazine that I get that I highly recommend. It's from the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, and they just happen to have this. And this, this picture is on my door. Um, when you, if you knock on my door at work, there's this picture. And there's several other poems. Um, there's the Maya Angelou poem, Still I Rise. And then there's a poem um, by Mary Oliver, a very uh, well-known poem called The Journey. H have any of you heard of that poem? Yes, yeah. Um, and then a, um, I was looking up, since I very much enjoy Rumi's poetry, I was looking up Rumi and resilience, right? And I, and I came across this, I think, a very amazing poem that he wrote. So what we would like you to do now is to uh, feel comfortable, relax, take a look at these poems. Uh, if a if a poem speaks to you, a line in the poem, an image from it, um, you, there are art supplies here. You could draw a picture, it's in this corner. Uh, there's art supplies. You could write off of the poem. Um, if you don't want to use the poem, but something in the presentation spoke to you, you could write something about that. Um, this isn't um, an English class. This is about your own freedom of expression. Right, so we're going to give you some time to do that. And, and I also thought that each of these poems has something to do with resilience. So you're, you're welcome to write about resilience. You're also welcome to write about trauma, hurt, and healing, or anything else that, that comes to you. Okay, so we're going to give you about um, 10 minutes or so for that. Um, don't feel that you have to complete a project. You don't have to complete this. You can just start it, whatever feels comfortable to you. Okay? Thank you. And feel free to go anywhere in the room. Make yourself comfortable. Art supplies over
so I'd like you to uh, finish up for now, knowing that you can go back to your writing or your artwork later. So, I, so I'd like um, if someone might feel comfortable in sharing uh, what they, what poem, what inspired them, um, and to share with the group. And I'm going to hand you the microphone uh, so that you, everyone can hear you and it can be recorded too. Yeah. Thank you. You want me to stand or be good? Um, it's a performer in me, I'm sorry. Um, I, I think uh, there were a few things, um, a few poems that really spoke to me. One of them was um, in The Two Kinds of Intelligence, uh, the last part. Uh, this second knowing is a fountainhead from within you moving out. And then the other part that kind of spoke out the most was in, uh, in The Journey. Um, As you left their voices behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds, and there was a new voice. And what came to me <clears throat> was an image of um, breaking through, opening up curtains, and peeling away and trying to, trying to see through or, or um, be seen. And then, interestingly enough, uh, there was a fountain of water of, of wisdom and healing and nurturing coming up from underneath. So. You're welcome. You're welcome. Anybody else? I liked, well, I liked Mary Oliver's poem. If we're judging poems, I liked her poem the best. Um, I've actually taught Rumi here. I taught a class called Seven Visionary Poets, and I taught Rumi's work. And um, there are a couple of lines from his work that aren't in that poem that I think are really important. And one of those lines is, um, darkness is your candle. And whatever, is hurting, whatever hurts you serves you. And um, um, judge, another line is, judge a moth by the beauty of its candle. And I always thought he you know, could really express th that kind of pro problematic transcendence really well. I don't know where this came from, but it was when I was listening to you guys talk. This is, uh, when I f this is me feeling pissed off, which I feel all the time. But yet, in the middle of that pissed offness is a righteous pool of calm reason and the knowledge that I'm right about those things I'm pissed off about. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else want to share? Yes, no? Would either of you like to share? Yes, no? No? OK. Yeah. <laughs> and if you don't want to share uh, what you made, does anyone want to share anything that came up from the workshop? Um, I wrote down the word resilience, and I, I looked at it for the first time, and I saw that it's almost like it says resilience. It's like I just I got the the word silence jumped out at me, and I and I thought about my own um, how did I deal with with trauma in my life, and and a lot of it was dealt with in getting quiet and and being in the silence instead of the noise or trying to escape the noise. So I actually wrote a little, little I don't know what this is, but uh, I wrote, the shock of trauma is loud, deafening, freezing the warm blood that carries the sound current that is our very nature. The stiffness, the icy stare, the scream that pulses in some distant place, waiting, just waiting for sweet release. Resilence was my healing path calming the noise in my head and descending into the polar ice, sobbing warm tears that melted the pain. Thank you. So it's nearly 8 o'clock. Um, if there's any comments or questions or whatever, 
right, about the workshop. Jody and I would be happy to talk with you, or we can also talk with each other. And here's, we have a bibliography. I'd be happy to send you the bibliography, right? I have some cards, too, that I haven't put out yet that I can give to you. Any, um, anything else that you would like to say or share? Can I just say one thing when I was looking sure. at the Creative Arts Therapy Certificate Program here? Yes. When I was looking at the Creative Arts Therapy Certificate Program here, um, I was just looking at all the different disciplines they cover, and they don't cover writing. And I, that's very mysterious. There's drama, there's dance, there's you know, other things. And I thought writing is so important. Yeah. It's so absolutely important. We actually have, <coughs> we have a writing therapy course this semester uh, for the first time. It's that's cool. um, transformative writing, and it starts, um, I think it starts, it starts it's the 7th the, the, of okay. March. Yeah. yeah. No, no, March. I think, I think March 7th. Is that the next one? Then the, yeah. the, the final one is um, Developmental Transformations, which is a drama therapy. But we've been wanting to do a writing therapy course, uh, a full three credit course. This is just a one credit course. But it's with um, a very uh, well known poetry therapist. So I, I recommend taking that. We, we, we did have a writing therapy course for years. But the teacher uh, moved away, and uh, we we haven't found someone to replace her f for. Uh, y yeah. Yeah. But thanks for yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Um, hopefully, you can take the one that that we have uh, well, starting I'm not soon. I'm a teacher. So. I know, <laughs> but you can still take I just it. Take it, yeah. <laughs> but thanks for the push. We'll 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 work on okay. getting more courses in writing therapy. I just noticed because I'm teaching. Any other questions about our Creative Arts Therapy Program? Um, we are actually having a Creative Arts Therapy Week. Um, on March 19th, we'll have an open house from 12 to 2 p.m. in this very room. So uh, if you'd like to come back, if you have time, uh, we're gonna have little mini workshops in Creative Arts Therapy. For over those two hours, and one of the projects is actually making a, a quilt. So you'll each get to have a, a little um, square with your own uh, message on it, and it will be hanging it. I'm not sure yet where it's going to be, but it's going to be a, an installation here at the new school. So I hope to see you all on March 19th here at Walman Hall. So thank you very much, Diana and Jody. I wanted to say too that it's so curious and kind of delightful for me that the metaphor of bird that wants to fly has actually flown me <laughs> to many places, including here um, and also um, um, uh, Emily Nash, who's the director of the Therapeutic Arts Alliance and I um, have been accepted to present Bird That Wants to Fly in a storytelling conference in Czechoslovakia. So that bird is an eagle, right? <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs>